Like nearly every filmmaking discipline, color grading involves a ton of subjectivity. From the look we initially envision for a project to the thousands of moves that we make to get there, most of what we do seems to be a matter of feel and personal taste. And this volume and variety of subjective choice in the grading process makes it easy to forget that image mastering isn't an art, it's a craft, which means that in addition to its subjective aspects, color grading also involves objective measurements and manipulations. In fact, I wanna offer a radical notion to you. Most of what we do in color grading can and should be navigated using objective factors. In this series, we're exploring grading tasks which we can tackle more effectively and more efficiently by bringing objective tools into the mix. And today, we're taking a look at colorimetry, or the way we reproduce and manipulate color. Let's get into it. So let's explore some objective principles that we can make use of when we're dealing with color reproduction and color manipulation in our grades. Now, if you haven't checked out part one in this series where we discussed an objective approach to exposure and contrast, I definitely encourage you to start there because we're gonna build today on the ideas we discussed in that video. And like we did in that video, we're gonna tackle this workflow in three basic steps, starting here from this raw camera negative, which is obviously very desaturated and needs to have its colors popped and defined. And we're gonna work our way from the purely technical and purely objective adjustments out to the more creative and expressive pieces as we go through this process. So the first thing that I wanna do here is set up a good image pipeline. I basically want to transform from my camera color space to my Rec. 709 display color space. And I'm gonna do that in two pieces. I'm gonna map myself from my airy camera color space into my working color space, like so. Leave a couple empty nodes for where I'm gonna do all of my grading and tuning and adjusting. And then downstream of those, I'm gonna do a second transform that's gonna take me from my working color space out to my display color space. And you can see just by setting up this image pipeline using good image science, my image is looking a lot better than it did a moment ago in terms of its colorimetry. And I haven't had to make any guesses or turn any knobs or rely on my eye or my creativity. And for the duration of this project, I will never need to go back to this step and reevaluate it and wonder if I've done it correctly. It is objective and it's exactly what's needed as the foundational layer of my colorimetry. So step one with our colorimetry, as we did with our exposure and contrast, is is to set up a good image pipeline. And that becomes really even more critical when it comes to our colorimetry because if we don't do this, then we're really guessing at how the colors that the camera saw are being reproduced on our display and whether they are at all accurate to what the camera saw or to what you or I would see if we'd been standing there when the images were captured. You can trust me when I tell you this is not a job that you want to have. You want to hand this part of the process off to good image science and ensure that you're setting up a foundation of accurate color reproduction. And next up, I'm just gonna quickly go through the steps that we took in part one of this video and set up my exposure and contrast where I wanna see those things go. I think I can pull just about an even stop of exposure here. And then I'm gonna go in and do my creative contrast. I think we can get just a little more overall contrast here in the image before I start looking at my colors in earnest. So now that we've got step one in place, I wanna move on to step two, which is kind of halfway in between the purely technical and the purely creative. That's my color temperature. And color temperature is a bit like exposure in the way we discussed it in part one, in that it can be both corrective and creative. For example, I might shoot something under tungsten light with my camera rated for a daylight source and need to later correct that in my grade, or I may simply creatively want to give my entire project or a particular scene or a particular shot a strong color wash of warm or cool color or even just a little splash of those things. So color temperature is situated kind of somewhere in the middle, somewhere in between the purely objective, purely technical considerations that we began with and the purely expressed 
impressive, purely creative hand adjustments, which we are going to conclude with. Now, with that said, even though color temperature does have a creative component to it, I can still apply it and I should apply it in an objective way so that I'm not guessing or just freehanding here on my RGB wheels. So the tool I'm gonna to use to do this is my Colloid Kelvin tool, which was designed for this exact purpose, to give me technically accurate color temperature manipulation up and down the Kelvin axis. So in the case of this image, I think I wanna cool things off just a little bit. I'm gonna say by about 600 degrees and let's see how that's looking. I feel like that's giving me a little bit better separation, a little bit better color harmonies. So I like where that's living and that's not a purely corrective measure that I've just taken. That's more of a creative call. However, I'm applying it in an objective way where I'm not having to guess and run the risk that I've already identified of inaccurately reproducing my colors and having skin tones that are too green, for example, or skies that are too pink, whatever the case may be. With this tool, I'm running very neutrally along the color temperature axis, and whether I'm making a creative or a corrective adjustment, I'm doing it in a nice objective way that's free of guesswork and that I don't have to reevaluate as long as I'm happy with what I'm seeing. And then the final step that we're gonna go into is the purely subjective and purely creative pieces that most of us begin our grading process with. Now that I have a foundation of good color management that's giving me accurate color reproduction, and I've gone in and gotten creative with my color temperature without unduly influencing my image in the direction of pink or green or any other cast that I don't want, I can get purely creative and I can go in and really spend time on finessing various aspects of the frame. And in the case of this image, I feel like I would like to deepen the color of my talent's lipstick here. So let's tackle that now. I'm gonna create a new serial node, close my open effects tab for now, and I'm gonna go over to my curves and I'm gonna look up my hue versus loom curves because what I wanna do is find a particular hue and drop its luminance. Let's zoom in on our image so we can see what we're doing nice and clearly. And I'm gonna zoom in on my talent's lipstick. I'm gonna tap a region of the color which I wish to isolate. And if I look at my hue versus loom curve here, what I'm seeing is an X axis, which represents hue, and I've selected a region of my hues right here. And I've got a Y axis, which represents luminance, and that's what I'm now going to manipulate. So I'm gonna take the middle of these three control points that have automatically been dropped for me, and I'm gonna lower this to taste and just go until I feel like I've got a deeper shade of red, and we can now zoom out on our image and enable disable and see how that's looking. Maybe I've gone a bit far with that, so I'm gonna go maybe kind of halfway in between where I started and where I initially set that control point. And I think that's looking really nice. And this is a great example of the type of creative flourish that we can make on our image once we've established a strong foundation and we're not chasing our tails trying to figure out, gosh, did I come in a bit green or are things a little bit warm? And if so, what's to blame for that? Where do I go in and make those adjustments? Did I do something wrong? Is this the way the footage is coming in innately? I've got a good foundation that leaves me very little room for having to second guess. And now I'm free to get creative, to get expressive within that construct and make refinements and adjustments as my eye dictates. So I hope you guys can see from this demonstration that in some ways the colorimetry aspect of our grading process is even more important to employ some objective principles and methodologies with than exposure and contrast because we really want to get a foundation of accurate reproduction. So we don't need to worry about whether we are being accurate and we can simply worry about whether the image is as pleasing as it can possibly be. And we can worry about the aesthetics and making manipulations on top of that baseline of accuracy depending on our creative vision for the project. As we've seen today, our approach to colorimetry stands to benefit just as much from objective methodology as when we're dealing with exposure and contrast. The truth is, regardless of what we're tackling in our grades, anchoring our work in good image science is the only way to ensure results that are pleasing, accurate, and consistent. If you have questions or thoughts on anything we've discussed in this series, I'd love to hear them down below. See you next time.